Welcome everyone. Um, I am Anne Carew. I'm the Curatorial Officer at the RMIT Design Archives and we've got Simone Rule over there in the corner who's the Archives Officer and Jenna Blythe over in that corner who's the Collections Coordinator and this is Marius here. Um, before we start, I'd just like to um, acknowledge the people of the Wawarong and Boonarong language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose unceded lands we conduct the business of the university. RMIT respects, respectfully acknowledges their ancestors and elders, past and present. RMIT also acknowledges the traditional custodians and ancestors of the lands and waters across Australia where we conduct our business. We're really delighted to welcome you all today to the RMIT Design Archives for our Rare Book Week event. Um, and this session is on Champion Books and Backyard Press, an experimental publishing collective established in Greville Street, Paran in the late 1970s. The RDA first um, acquired a small archive of books, magazines and postcards relating to Backyard Press from its founder, Ted Hopkins, in 2011. And uh, we just only just moved into this building and Marius has actually been involved with this um, acquisition for, since then. Um, in the issue of the journal in 2011, he published a short article on our collection, which is in this location here. Um, just if you're not familiar with the RMIT Design Archives, we focus on collecting uh, records from World War II to the present day. And we are interested in um, Melbourne design, Melbourne design practitioners. And our special interest is collecting archives that demonstrate the process of design. Um, so Marius is our guest speaker. He's a lecturer in RMIT School of Design. And um, he's also now the custodian of another small archive relating to this publishing company, which you can see on the table from here. Um, and um, he's also recently published a more extensive article on Backyard Press and Champion Books in the latest edition of the RMIT Design Archives Journal, which is on the table there. And there are copies available on the black desk. Um, So we're delighted to have Marius here and have his insights. He began working for Champion Books not long after they were established and has is a wealth of information about this really interesting period in Melbourne publishing. Um, the other thing I just wanted to note is that we are recording today. Um, if anyone is concerned about that, would they please come and see me and we'll um, make a note. I think that's all. So I'll hand over to Marius. Thank you. I don't think I need that one. Oh, great. So coming through. Um, hello, and um, thank you for coming. It's really uh, fascinating for me to be here and to see this spread out um, as it is. Um, I, um, prior to the exhibition that happened recently, I hadn't really um, paid much attention to this body of work that we produced back in the 70s and 80s. So it's really nice to see it come back into um, circulation and get an, uh, an audience um, for it. it um, the preparation for the exhibition really um, reminded me of the times and also the um, huge effort that we put into making these things um, collectively and across a whole range of, a uh, whole period of time. Um, so here it is, and um, it, it's accompanied by some really interesting ephemera, which also sort of triggers some um, great um, re memories, but also ideas about what was going on. Um, as Anne said, I, I work at RMIT. I run the program called the Master of Design Futures. Um, we do uh, design that is all around the intangible services, organisational change. And I was saying to my students that um, back in the day, I used to be a, a real designer, um, producing real things 
like books, on real machines, uh, like these printing presses in the publication. Um, today we're doing very intangible things like services, machines are the laptop that we work with, um, and we do it all online. So it's, again, it's really nice to be re-engaged with the, um, uh, the non-digital. This was all analogue, of course, everything existed before that. Um, as a way of building context and introducing myself um, and my own interest in books, I just wanted to tell a tale of um, my background and my parents. Um, it contains sectarian division, um, burning books and uh, football rivalry, which I'm hoping fits this audience's interests. Um, my parents, Margaret and Bern Foley, uh, lived in Melbourne up until the early 50s. They were very um, highly engaged in a whole range of different sort of social um, activities, particularly the Catholic Social Action Movement. Um, some of you will um, know the name B.A. Santa Maria. He was very prominent in that. Um, the right wing of the, um, of the Catholic movement and the Labor Party. Um, <coughs> Mum and Dad also active in building um, uh, I guess uh, fundraising for the war effort um, prior to that. Um, they pr um, built a, a really interesting sports park in, um, called Brennett Park out by Croydon as a way of engaging athletes in producing events for um, which would then generate money for the war effort. Um, so they were sort of active and very public people. They had ran a haberdashery out in Croydon um, doing quite well and lived in Calorama, um, sort of living the life really. Um, things unfortunately became a bit unstuck though because it, in Melbourne at the time was highly sectarian. It was Protestant versus Catholic. It was um, public service Catholic versus Protestant corporate. It was um, uh, um, that sort of, um, yeah. Um, and it was that time where people really divided into those two camps. Mum and Dad were on the Catholic side. Um, a number of things happened in their life, in their business, that really gave them cause to move out of Victoria. Um, it was part of this sectarian sort of um, rivalry, if you like. Um, they moved from Melbourne uh, up the east coast of Australia, eventually landing in Toowoomba in Queensland. Um, if you can imagine in the early 50s, that shift from Melbourne, which was culturally sophisticated, to um, Queensland, and no offence to Queenslanders, um, I'm one myself, um, uh, very much a part of the, um, uh, the backwater of Australian culture in that time. So Mum and Dad took with them a collection of really um, interesting small press um, first edition books, which they had collected from their co colleagues and friends while they were in Melbourne. Um, again, some of you might know the Hawthorne Press. Um, that was uh, run by John Gardner, a printer and publisher of the time. Um, he had a very um, extensive network of authors and um, uh, artists who he'd worked with. Names that I remember from my youth are Frank Clune and Clive Turnbull but um, there's a whole range of others which um, were published by Hawthorne. Um, so Mum and Dad took this collection of books with them as a way of sort of reminding them where they came from and hopefully f um, pulling that into their um, new life in Toowoomba. Um, sadly, when they got there, they, um, they bought a house, they um, started to set themselves up, they employed a painter to come in and repaint the whole house, the whole... Um, new life was about to start. Uh, unfortunately, that painter left the uh, flame gun on and the house was burnt. Uh, along with that, um, that large collection of books, rare first edition, small press um, publications, largely went up. Uh, I can see the <laughs> size. And, <laughs> um, and so 
what we were left with was this sort of remnant collection of tinged fire burnt uh, books, uh, <laughs> which nevertheless found their way into our um, library um, and moved around with us from house to house where we moved after that. And for me, and I think this is um, you know, my own psychological sort of analysis, but that burnt into my mind the idea of the book and it became something that I was really attached to um, from that point on. Um, and uh, there was a number of opportunities in Queensland, of course, to be able to take that and to develop that um, work, but it was also the time of Bielke Peterson, um, and the, the idea of um, culture and activity was pretty hard to, to generate. And so um, it occurred to me to come back to Melbourne um, to connect with the sort of sophisticated lifestyle that mum and dad talked about and to see what was this um, uh, uh, environment where books could be made and sold and an economy um, built around this type of publishing. So I came back um, in the late 70s. I, um, I worked first at a place called Walker Press uh, Walker Press named after the character in the Phantom comics. Um, Walker was a political printing company. It was predated the fast printers, so there was no access to really quick um, printing at that time. Um, Walker had small offset presses. Um, it worked for all of the political activist groups at the time, feminist, land rights, gay and lesbian, um, residential and so on. So it produced a whole lot of material and was a really engaging place to work because there's a constant flow of people coming in with new issues to work through and new ways of um, activating, etc. So the Walker Press was, uh, like Backyard, was a, almost a, a commune collective. Um, so people lived on the premises. It was located where 3CR is now in Smith Street. Um, people lived there, there were activist groups meeting there, there was publishing and printing going on constantly. So really energetic and vibrant place, but again one of those places where a printing was much more of a, um, a secondary activity rather than a creative activity. At that time I picked up a, um, a note in the age, a little article um, with the heading, uh, football player turns poet and publisher. And that intrigued me, um, and I thought this is um, exactly what I'm looking for, that sort of um, strange connection that often happens in a place like Melbourne. Um, so I read the article, I got in touch with um, Ted Hopkins, who was the football player, and um, let him know that I was working in printing and I was interested in what he was doing. Uh, for those of you interested in football in Melbourne, um, you'll know the t name Ted Hopkins as the person who changed the match between Carlton and Collingwood in 1970. Um, that was, again, one of those classic Melbourne rivalries of the um, Collingwood working class, Carlton Moore establishment. I think Malcolm Fraser was number one ticket holder of Carlton at the time. Um, <coughs> so Ted playing for Carlton um, was uh, both um, uh, heralded by half of the city and hated by the other half. Um, so a very interesting character in that sense of being right at that uh, fault line in the, in the city. Um, Ted also shocked Melbourne by having um, effectively um, changed the nature of that grand final uh, win for Carlton, um, immediately left football. Um, which was like a heresy at the time. Um, he went off to um, do skiing instructing and um, writing poetry, um, which horrified the uh, football scene. <laughs> However, he was very adept at using his football um, prominence, his profile, as a way of getting attention for what he was doing. Um, so Ted had moved from... Um, Yalorn, where he was living, and he brought with him um, a small offset press that his father, who was a dry cleaner, had um, been using. His father had died, Ted picked up the press and thought this is an opportunity to start printing. Um, so he moved that to 48 Greville Street in Paran, um, and incidentally, across the road was this um, collection of 
um, in four or five terrace houses a collection of the up-and-coming live music musicians in uh, Melbourne. So they were playing local rock and roll, um, very active, um, constantly on the go, constantly needing promotion, but having very little money to uh, produce it. So that um, uh, connection um, quickly um, firmed up. They, kept, they knew that Ted was there and, and could print things for them. We, um, by that time I'd started working, we were collecting remnant paper from the bigger, more commercial printer down the road and producing all this work. So again, we're generating this sort of little community of, of um, people who are out there creatively very active in the music scene. What happened then, which was unexpected, I think, was that we um, started to get known as the printer for the live music scene. So venues set up, um, San Moritz and the ballroom in St Kilda, a whole range of other places around Melbourne. Um, they were populated then by people who were um, growing audience and that produced yet another level of economy. And that economy then started to um, uh, generate those large festivals and the large international tours that um, you're probably part of at some point. Um, bigger venues set up, um, international artists came in. So what happened with Backyard Press was we grew not only in um, the amount that we could produce, but in the size of the work. So we went from these small publication size pamphlets and things into large screen prints and then um, as I was showing before that um, printing machine here which would do a 60 inch by 40 inch poster and that would then be used as what they called um, six or eight sheeters so you'd have six of them across a billboard or eight of them across the billboard so really um, not only grow in the size of the um, economic side of the company but also in the, um, uh, the scale of the work. <coughs> what we did then with Backyard was what we set out to do initially. We used the funds that we were coming um, and we were getting through this commercial side to do the creative work um, that we were looking for. So um, Ted uh, had a number of um, colleagues and um, friends, uh, Gary Catalano, um, Sally Morrison, um, whose work he was pretty keen to publish, and we started there. And then we realised we could be much more adventurous and use this as an opportunity to really explore what printing was and what publishing was. Um, <coughs> so we would never have been able to do the type of work that we ended up with. I'll just get this... without both the expertise that we built and the um, connections as well as the printing uh, facilities. So we had um, uh, a large 20 by 30 inch printer, a large screen printing table, a smaller um, uh, A4 size uh, offset press. And with all of that, we started to um, produce work. Things that we couldn't do, we sent out to other um, printers who um, we'd already made connections with. And in that sort of um, small business economy, we were um, supporting them by giving them commercial work that we couldn't do. So there was a nice uh, reciprocity with it. <coughs> so um, we started uh, with this one here. As I said, Ted came from Yulorn. Um, for those of you who don't know, Yulorn was a um, state electricity commission town. It was built by the SEC. Um, they realised at one point that there was an incredible coal seam under Yulorn uh, and they wanted to get to it, so they literally moved the town and uh, replaced people in um, uh, local areas. Um, this here is the um, indication of the um, I think the power stacks that they were going to build here um, and they were ac accessing that coal from underneath. Um, <clears throat> so this was horrific of course from the locals um, but one of those things that you can do in a company town because you own it so you just shift it. Um, <clears throat> so Ted living there at the time um, produced this work. Um, it's a combination of report and poetry uh, um, and it was a way of sort of alerting people in Melbourne to the fact that this was going on. Um, 
one of our first pieces and we spent quite a bit of time on this working out the, um, the way that we'd present it. So we set it up as a corporate report simile, if, um, if you like. Um, so that led us then to um, a much larger piece of work. These are, won't be in sequence, but uh, I'll um, take you through them. Um, the Book of Slab. <coughs> so the Book of Slab, um, Ted, I guess, is as worked by Ted Hopkins. Um, Ted is a poet of the everyday. Um, so he picked up this idea of um, using ephemera, um, the, the things that we use in our everyday life as the context for his poetry. Um, and the book itself, while it doesn't um, always appear as um, a collection of poems, is <coughs> um, designed in that way. So it's to be read as an extensive um, uh, observation, I think, on the world um, and um, uh <coughs> opportunity to <coughs> pay homage, in a way, to some of the ephemera and the materials that were um, around <coughs> at the time. What interest, interested us as well was how do we construct this as a book? So rather than just print it and publish it, what are the things that we could br bring to it that were unique or talked really about the material of printing, uh, paper, ink, um, type, image and so on. Um, so it was a construction, um, a, uh, a compilation, an assemblage as much as it was the, um, the content of the work. Um, uh, I'm just trying to look for... Not coming up in this one. Um, as an example, um, one of the inserts into the book was... Not appearing here. Uh, I'll let you have a look at that anyway. Um, uh, a small single, um, vinyl single called Slab Goes Italiano, um, which was a recorded, literally recorded piece of music which was inserted in here for people to play. So um, I think I've got a nice um, uh, quote here that talks about it. This is from Judith Hothberg from the Quarterly Review of Books by Artists um, in America. Um, this limited edition bush book work is an ambitious undertaking that is a multimedia performance. It defies any ordinary definition of book, book work, artist book or even book experience. It is a different experience created by print, a poet, printer, typographical master, artist, universal seeker, um, which I think really sums it up nicely. And it grabbed the, um, our intention um, of producing this other thing. Um, <coughs> then we move to um, this work by Peter Lysiotis. And some of you might know Peter's work. Peter um, <coughs> was a, is a um, photo uh, montagist, um, did some really um, fascinating work in the style of John Hartfield, who was a European photo montagist from the um, uh, wartime. Uh, <coughs> uh, Peter was a migrant. Um, I think his parents came out um, with him early in his life. Um, he had a migrant experience of Melbourne, which again is one of those really sort of unique um, intersections or interfaces with culture. He, um, while very strongly multicultural, was also interested in that experience from a critical perspective. So not just accepting it as a, a nice to have, he was sort of looking at it from the perspective of the person who actually goes through it. Um, so he brought this photo montage project into the um, Champion books. The way we worked in Champion, because we were voluntary, was that if you had a project that you wanted to work on, you actually had to drive it. Um, so yes, we'd work and collaborate on the printing side, but um, you had to do a lot of that work of either finding money or um, working out uh, with us on the design and so forth. So this was a really interesting <coughs> project um, Journey of a Wise Electron. I'll just read this piece, which I quite like as a descriptor of what Peter was doing. 
Um, that's Peter. Peter is still an active um, uh, bookmaker. Um, to my parents who taught me how to watch and how to adjust, uh, which was a really nice, neat way of sort of looking at this um, very slim uh, experience of the television experience at the time. Uh, <coughs> Peter brought this in. We decided that um, the way to treat this work, which was collage um, and from source material, was to give it a sense of quality. And we noticed that the tonal ranges were really quite challenging to work with. You have this really dark end of the, of the range and these very subtle colours, subtle greys as well. <coughs> so we discovered this process, which other printers knew about, um, called the duotone. And it, literally it's two plates to achieve the one piece of work. So one plate would give you your dark end and the other plate would give you your um, lighter tone. So you could get that full range, um, which was um, challenging, but really satisfying for us to, to work through that process. Um, we were really lucky at the time to um, be sharing the premises with a person who was a master plate maker, um, whose job was making film, if you know the offset process, it's a, a piece of film which is exposed with the imagery and the type. It's laid on a plate which has an emulsion on it. That plate is then washed and uh, um, where the emulsion is is where the ink takes and um, then offsets onto the paper. Uh, <coughs> this uh, person, whose name I forget, uh, was such a master that he could actually do what was called dot etching. So in the film um, stage you would have a piece of film with a gradated dot um, which was a, allowed the ink to, um, to break into those tones. And he would reduce that size of the dot by simply rubbing etching over it and then stop when he found that it, it was at the right point. So if you imagine these dots in minuscule, um, and that level of expertise, of course, doesn't ex exist anymore, um, uh, but it was something that he brought to it. So it, again, was a collaboration of experts in the, in the trade as well as people who were um, interested in the creative art side of it. Um, so the duo tones were extremely challenging, I think, um, from the uh, little bit of research that I found about it, um, we didn't document much of this, of course, um, 72 plates were made, so two plates per colour, um, and there was a lot of wastage because you couldn't, um, couldn't use it unless it was working properly. Um, so that's a really interesting one um, to have a look at. Um, <coughs> what would have been a, a massive cost was something that we were able to do both with trading off these skills and um, working with our own ability to work on that. Um, <coughs> and then, I'm not sure how this time's going. <laughs> well, let me get back to it. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, cool. Um, good idea. Um, this one here, I might, thanks. This one here is by an artist, um, a contemporary artist who's still working, Paul Green. Um, and this was a, a fast piece, I guess. It was something that we thought, let's see if we can turn it out. Um, these larger th uh, pieces, of course, they would go over 18 months or two years because there was a huge amount of work and production involved. But this one was something that we wanted to um, do quite quickly. Um, both in terms of getting it out, but also to um, honour the immediacy of the imagery that's in there. Um, my favourite of which is, um, I think it's at the start, the rabbit and the turtle with the caption, it was a, um, it was a great day for the start of a fable, um, which was sort of indicative, I think, of our sort of approach to these types of works. We were um, out there to create this, um, this fable. Um, so Paul um, is a painter, but uh, as you can see from this work, really interesting in the concepts and um, how they're presented. We grab this little image here um, of the tree in the wire guard as the um, branding for, backyard, for the champion books. Again, that sort of idea of 
the everyday um, elevated into something like a logo. Um, uh, the quote about Paul's work, um, <coughs> a collection of drawings and words which gives a unique perspective on the business of creation and some of its more sordid activities, including war and heroes, tourists and invaders, somewhat full of cynicism, sarcasm and comedy. Paul um, is a practising artist and now living in Aubrey. Um, then we move on to this one. I'll grab... Ah, thanks. Um, <coughs> another work by Ted Hopkins. I should say... Um, Ted's uh, still alive, but sadly has dementia, so otherwise he would have been here. He would love to talk to you about his work, um, but uh, that's not possible, so hopefully I'm doing it on um, credit. Um, this book, again, sort of talks to the idea of the poetry of the everyday. This is a Teledex um, simulation. Uh, you may remember the Teledex as a little device that sat by the landline, um, an index of phone numbers and um, f uh, contacts. You'd um, dial that up or down, pick that, press a button, it would come up at that tabbed index page. Um, that wasn't quite possible to achieve, um, but we did this simulation. So again, taking the idea of the book and putting it into a totally different format, but um, sort of evoking the idea of the everyday as well. So these poems by Ted are in alphabetical order, so you can um, dial up your poem depending on the uh, letter of the alphabet that you're most interested in at the time. Um, Along with uh, producing this piece of work, um, the intention was to sell it as a subscription. Um, so you would actually subscribe to the book with the idea that um, every now and again a new alphabetical index page would be sent to you. From memory, no one, uh, we didn't go to that point. <laughs> I don't think anyone subscribed, but it was again saying, what is it about the book? How, what's the interface with the book and its reader? Um, and where can we interrupt that and change it um, for some effect? So again, that's a really interesting one to look at. I guess um, one of the, it's quite heavy. <laughs> one of the things that we noticed there when we were producing it, we were sending it out to be collated. Um, we got a call from the um, person who was in the bindery company saying, sorry, we can't do this. There's a uh, foul word on one of the pages and the, the women collators are not prepared to, uh, <laughs> to work on it. Um, so we had to find yet another workaround to that little instance. Um, <coughs> so, um, uh, yeah, again, that sort of idea of pushing the book into a different space um, and looking to see what it does. How do people respond to that? And then I might um, conclude with this one, um, Art and a Texter. So at the time, um, in the 80s, mid-80s, um, a local art critic, um, uh, Paul Taylor, was producing a publication called Art and Text. Art and Text, we actually printed, um, Art and Text was a highly intellectual um, critique of um, local and international art, very well respected um, by people in the area, but it took a very strong postmodernist um, perspective. Um, again, one of these sort of fault lines started to open up between the, the modernists and the postmodernists. Um, probably in backyard we had a, a representative from both sides. Um, people like Ted and others were very much on the modernist side, saw it as a bit sort of um, arrogant in its pretense to be um, writing about art in a particularly um, abstract way, theoretical way. Um, others within the, uh, within the collective um, were seeing it as um, a really um, interesting intervention into the Melbourne art scene, that postmodernism, the intellectualism, the theories, etc. Um, after a number of us had left, um, Ted and others produced this work 
called Art and a Texter. So it was a um, parody on art and text. Um, its intention was to take it down um, and to be playful, I guess, to be um, fair with it. Um, interestingly, Paul Taylor was the um, sort of person who didn't take that um, lightly. Um, so Paul took them to court um, on the idea that this was passing off in other words, being um, uh, sold as the actual art and text. Um, so they went to court. Um, it didn't, he didn't win, um, but there was a general settlement that it wouldn't be um, sold. Um, so again, I guess on that um, fault line, I'll end where I started with this sort of idea of um, division and inter intersections and connections within Melbourne. Um, and in a way, celebrating the fact that a city like Melbourne could allow these sort of things to um, happen and a, a general market to exist for them. Um, yeah, thank you.